Do I hear a second? Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Um, and Chris Pip has arrived. Let's just make sure that she is able to hear and speak. Speak and be visible, rather. Welcome, Chris. We were just getting started. Okay, so um, as I was uh, uh, opening the meeting, the first item is to uh, cover any adjustments to the agenda. Annie, can you take us through them? Uh, we don't have adjustments to the agenda. Okay, terrific. Thank you. Um, now we'll open it up to public comment. Um, if you're a member of the public, you're welcome to make a comment. Your comments should be limited to three minutes. Um, if you're interested in making a comment, please go ahead and raise your digital hand and we will unmute you. Okay, seeing none, we will proceed with the agenda. The first item for presentation and discussion is the approval of the 2023-2024 handbooks. Annie. Yes, yeah, so we, the school committee and the public had access to the summary of changes and the entire handbook linked into the agenda. I understand that we have a very packed agenda. I've asked the that principals are told them that they don't need to present anything formally. However, if any school committee member has any questions about the proposed changes, uh, Jen or April are certainly happy to answer those. I don't have any questions. Um, are there any questions from my colleagues? None for me. Thanks, you, Mayor. All right. So, uh, Annie, we'll need to vote on those. Yes, motion for each one, please. So, a motion to entertaining a motion to approve the Hopkins Academy Handbook as presented. So moved. Or do you need to say it? I I think it's fine. A motion to <laughs> approve the Hopkins Academy <laughs> Handbook as as presented. So moved. Do I hear a second? Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Um, next, we'll pass the Hopkins uh, Hadley Elementary School agenda. A motion to approve the Hadley Elementary School handbook um, as recommended. So, so moved. Yeah, seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Right, terrific, thank you. Um, next, we are talking about co-hosting an exchange student from Spain with Smith Academy. Andy, can you tell us about that? I sure can. So again, linked into the agenda, sample materials. Smith Academy initiated this. They will be hosting students from Spain and have asked if we would be interested in accepting their overflow. They don't have enough host families. We spoke with Suzanne Boswell, who's actually here on the call today in the event that the school committee had any questions. You can see in the packet the kinds of materials that we would send out to interested families. Um, the company that organizes this takes care of insurance, takes care of all the communication with families, of ensuring that students who are here visiting have what they need, get what they need, and are a point of contact with the family. The students would spend a couple of days at Hopkins Academy shadowing. Then they, as you can see from their agenda, do all kinds of other things traveling around the area. And they have staff member, a staff member with them the entire time. It looks like a fantastic opportunity, and we'd like to make this available um, to our families and our school community, as well as help out our neighbor to the north. Annie, is this a two-way exchange? So 
It can be in the future, but we haven't gotten to that point yet. And it is not required if somebody hosts, if someone in the community hosts a student from Spain, it has not been required that their child go to Spain. Vice versa, it's not a requirement. Like if we were to uh, send students on an exchange in the future, then it's not a prerequisite that they have hosted first. So it can be, and we're looking into that for the future. Okay, very good. Um, any other questions for my colleagues? Um, I don't have any questions, but I, I, I think it personally is really exciting. So I'm kind of curious about lessons learned. Um, and, you know, in the future, if it's something we can host or if it's something in collaboration that works really well, it, it's, it's exciting. No questions from me. Great. Indeed, it is neat. Um, do you have a sense for how many students have been coming to Smith um, Academy through this program? So Suzanne may have a better idea of, uh, I do believe you've already told me the total cohort, but you can respond to that and what um, we're looking for and have the potential. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for letting me join your meeting and for discussing this as an opportunity for you. Um, this is our first time, work, would be our first time working with both schools. So I can tell you that this group from Zaragoza has traveled here many times with um, under my supervision, um, and they generally come with between 20 and 24 students, um, and they are placed um, my kids actually hosted as part of that group and did at their school did actually send a group, which was exciting. Um, and our school hosted 15 and a smaller school um, down 119. I'm in Pepperell at North Middlesex down 119 and Littleton um, hosted, I think the overflow of uh, additional, uh, I think it was around 12 kids there as well. So that's an average size group because we know that once you get over that size, it just becomes a little unwieldy. <laughs> All right. Thank you for that. And I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone has as, as part of the organizing company. Um, Paul, yes. Quick Go question ahead. about that. So if, if it looks like it's October, <clears throat> so we would, if we give approval today, then we would turn around and seek host families to volunteer. Exactly. Yep, I would work with the schools to help publicize um, the opportunity. Um, we could host meetings. I could come in and present to classes to the kids to say, hey, the school is hosting. This is what it looks like. If you're interested, here's some information. Um, and we can try all different angles to reach out to the families in the communities um, to share information by email. If it's on the school website to do presentations, either virtually or in person for parents at night, we could host a lunchtime meeting for working parents who might not be able to attend at night, but jump on a lunch call. So it would be a pretty much hit the ground running um, to find the host families. And that's exactly how it's actually going to be um, with the other school as well. And then the obligation you house, you feed, you drive the students around as needed. Yeah, exactly. So the transportation requested would all be to and from the host school. Um, so the Smith families would go to and from Smith Academy and Hopkins would go to and from there, including arrival day. We meet them at the airport, bring them up by bus. Um, the only expense we know a host family would incur would be the groceries to have the student join them in meals. Otherwise, the kids have their own spending money when they're with us on all of the excursions on the itinerary. We have a budget um, for their transportation, for their admissions, for their guides, for the tips for the guides, everything they would need during the day. So the only known expense is groceries. It would be entirely up to each host family if they chose to pay for things along the way. Okay. And then the kids don't need their own room. They just need their own bed. So they can either share a room or have their own room. It's not required that they have their own room. And it is only two weeks. I'm sure you saw that in the material, but it is um, two weeks. And again, it's, it's unclear exactly how many host families we'd need at Hopkins. Right, because we haven't started at either school. This has all come together um, since school let out in June. Thanks. Um, can I um, 
ask if we have 12 students that are overflow from Smith and we're only able to find seven host families, what would you do in that situation? Um, well, for me, it's not an option to not place them. So I would just keep keep going until I found something would get creative. We can um, do further outreach to uh, homeschool families. Maybe we would do a, you know, a, a reinvigoration of our efforts at each school. Um, some families that can offer to host two students. So we would, um, it's just, not, it's not an option that I don't find them. So it would be on me to do what I need to do to find the families. Thank you so much. Annie, if we vote to accept this, it will be for one year. So we can evaluate how it went and whether we'd want to do it again. Is that? So every time that if we were to do this again in any company, it would always be brought before you, just like every individual field trip is brought before you. So um, yes, if we were to do it in the future each time. Okay, very good. Your approval. Excellent. Um, so let I'm seeking a motion to approve the program, um, the exchange program as presented. So moved. Thank you, Paul. Seconded. Thanks, Tara. All in favor? Aye. All right. All right. Great. Thank you, Suzanne, for being with us and for uh, helping us uh, discover this interesting program. Great. Thank you very much for your time. All right. We're going to move on to the next item of the agenda. And that is the deep energy retrofit um, detailed scoping study and a discussion about this. Um, before I begin, I will just say uh, thank you so much to all the people involved in the um, the the um, study and um, bringing it to this point. Today we are. Um, really in listening mode and asking a lot of questions. We um, do not intend to uh, vote during this meeting as to how to proceed uh, with respect to any of the alternative um, options mentioned in the scoping study. Um, we will pursue that at the September 25th school committee meeting. Um, so just a you know heads up to anyone uh, viewing or um, watching the recording afterwards that this is an, a conversation that opens um, the di discussion and we will um, follow through and close the discussion in September. So we look forward to hearing from our constituents on the matter. Um, and first up with the DER criteria and benefits, Annie and Chris. Yes. And I am going to click record because I did not see- Recording in progress. So I might be duplicating, but I just wanna, I just noticed that I hadn't seen that earlier. Uh, so you'll see the first link in the agenda and then Chris and I are really turning it over to the folks who have done so much great work from Eversaurus and from Undocumented Control. Um, but just a reminder of where we are at. So we did a scoping study, the school committee put together a 10 year capital plan Colliers assisted us with that after we did an evaluation of our facilities. In the initial capital plan, the assumption was that we were replacing legacy energy sources, so fossil fuel sources, et cetera, with legacy. The school committee then met in August of last year and started talking about the fact that perhaps we should be exploring other options if we're about to uh, renovate the systems, the heating and cooling systems in the school, along with other energy systems. At the same time, the community of Hadley was pursuing designation as a green community. That's important to know because that also provides dollars to the community to invest in renovations that increase energy efficiency, decrease carbon emissions, and decrease dependence on fossil fuels. In order for the schools to be eligible for some of the incentives and reimbursements that are available when public entities, or I suppose when any entity, does deep energy retrofit work, so transitions away from fossil fuels and legacy fuels to modern energy sources, we have to do these steps 
That includes a scoping study, which you have a final copy linked to the agenda, and that is what Eversource and Andante K-12, so Matthew and Sarah will be speaking about today. And then from the scoping study, we go into technical assistance, because in order to be eligible for the incentives and rebates and other things, a, a deep energy retrofit building by definition, and you have this in, linked into your agenda, must reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 40% or more through HVAC electrification. So the scoping study tells us what options are available in order to meet the DER criteria. You'll see that delineated very clearly in that scoping study. And as you said, Humera, the school committee today, this is the opportunity to listen, to learn, to ask a lot of questions and to thoroughly digest all of this information, speak with your constituents between now and September 25th, because the school committee will need to vote on um, in the, and Sarah and Matthew will speak more to this, but in the ECMs are numbered, the acronym right, they're numbered one through six, I believe I don't have it right in front of me, but there are several options under two, two A, B, C, and D. And before proceeding to the technical assistance, the school committee would need to determine which of those options they wanted kind of fleshed out more thoroughly. So I will stop there. I just wanted folks to understand um, why we're doing this, where we are in the process, and what that DER stands for and means. And I think then I can turn it over to um, the folks who will be talking about the scoping study. Terrific. Matthew, um, welcome. Thank you for um, presenting the study. Um, take it away. Sure, sure. So thank you for having me. Uh, I appreciate it. I'll introduce myself. My name is Matthew McTeague. I am uh, an energy efficiency consultant for Eversource. I work, um, I'm assigned ex to work exclusively with municipal customers in Western Mass. So so anybody who is an Eversource customer in uh, Western Mass, so the, you know, the greater Springfield region, um, you know, I, I assist them with uh, energy efficiency incentives and and help them move projects forward. And, you know, before we dive into the specifics of the scoping study, I'll, I'll just kind of talk quickly about the, the incentive program and the deep energy ret retrofit offering. So, so everybody kind of understands it a little bit. Uh, if, if you're not familiar with MassSave, MassSave has been around for, geez, I don't know, um, 10, 15 years or so, uh, providing incentives for energy efficiency projects. Um, you know, we've done a lot of lighting projects over the years. You might you might have been involved with one of those in the past where, you know, a vendor comes in, um, installs some upgraded LED lighting, and Eversource gives you an incentive based upon the savings of those projects. Um, at the beginning of this year, MassSave and Eversource uh, developed a program called the Deep Energy Retrofit Offering. It was intended to, to help municipalities and, and all customers actually to look into deep energy retrofit projects, you know, reducing greenhouse gases by 40% or more, um, hopefully, or more in a lot of cases. And we are providing additional incentives on, on top of the already established energy efficiency incentives. So, so for any project that you decide to move forward with, there are still our standard energy efficiency incentives available to you. And on top of it, the deep energy retrofit package will give you an additional dollar per square foot incentive. So for instance, for the Hopkins Academy, it, if you guys continue through the plan and do the deep energy retrofit plan, you guys will get an additional $62,000 for, for the project, uh, which, which again is based upon the square footage of the building, which is 62,000 square feet. Um, so I can bring up a quick slide if I have sharing uh, capabilities to kind of walk you through the deep energy retrofit project can can you guys see my screen here with the deep energy retrofit flyer on there sure so um as, as stated um this program is intended to give you a guy a pathway to reduce uh, greenhouse gases by 40 percent or more in your building um it's a plan over three years uh step by step as as ann mentioned we are in the the scope the end of the scoping study phase which is the first phase, which I'll, I'll 
bring up another slide in a second and talk about it. Uh, we plan for these projects to take uh, about three years, over the course of three years. This is a, a very new offering for Eversource. So, you know, there's in the in the proposed scoping study that we sent you guys, we, we've already identified some, some things that we can improve on the next one that we do. And, uh, you know, we, we appreciate you guys understanding that. It's, it's new to us. It's new to you guys. And we're trying to figure out the, the best way to make this offering um, helpful for, for you guys and, and all of our customers alike. Um, so I'll share another slide now to not that one, this one. So this is a guide of the pathway of the DER um, process. It looks looks a little bit confusing, uh, but but I'll kind of walk you guys through it. Um, so we a couple months ago we started here where um, someone in town, someone um, had heard of the Deep Energy Retrofit program. They reached out to me. We we talked about the Hopkins Academy. It seemed uh, from that discussion like a good fit to to move forward with the scoping study. So we decided to continue with the scoping study here. And uh, for the scoping study, there was no cost to the town. It was completely covered by Eversource. And now we have done the building energy assessment. We have delivered the scoping study. We are now at this point, the decision to continue forward. Um, with One second, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Is everyone else seeing the original slide or is it just me? Yeah, I'm seeing the original slide, but I think he's, you're taking us through the stages on that same slide, is that correct? Uh, yeah, it's, it's on a different slide, actually. I apologize. It, it, uh, I might be sharing my, I might have, let me just adjust what I'm sharing here. Is that, did that bring up the next slide there now? It did. Yes. Yes. All right. My, my apologies. I, I thought it would just switch when I switched my screen here. Um, so to quickly go over it again here, we started a couple months ago here, um, where we, talked about the building with the town. We thought it might be a good fit after a quick discussion. We decided to move forward with the scoping study. And again, there was no cost to the town for the scoping study. It was it was paid for 100% by Eversource. Uh, we did the building energy assessment. We have provided you guys with the scoping study. And we are now here at the, the decision to continue forward with uh, the next step would be a much more in-depth technical assistance study of of any of the measures you guys to move forward you guys decide to move forward with we will do a much deeper technical assessment study to further flesh out the the savings the cost the whether this this project will actually be a good project to move forward with before we actually do um and the technical assistance study goes much deeper than what the scoping study you guys have provided uh, have been provided with. Um, they, you know, they will look at the the well fields to determine if if they can really support ground source heat pumps. They will, you know, get up into the ceilings and and look at much deeper into the equipment you have and study it much deeper. And it will be a much closer to actual cost and savings calculations at the end of the technical assess assessment studies. And is it um if I if I may ask a question, is it the same entity that does that study? Um I I believe so. Um uh, I have a couple uh other people from Eversource here to assist. I think they were having some camera trouble, but but Ryan or Fran, would would the same energy company, uh engineering company that did the scoping study also do the technical assistance study? Uh, they may not have co-hosting, so that I, may I be just, an issue. I okay, just perfect. made them co-hosts. Oh, sorry. I don't know why I don't have the option to do that. No worries. Yeah, thanks. Uh, good morning, everybody. Yes, it would be the same entity doing the uh, focus study as the scoping study. This is Ryan Willingham. Thank you, Ryan. And apologies for not being on camera, but that caused my computer to go haywire, so I'm going to stay off the camera so that I can don't need to restart during the meeting. No worries. All right, Matthew, please continue. Sure. And um, I'm, I'm kind of I think I've gotten through the beginning of the scoping study information here. Um, are, did the slide change to commercial equipment eligib eligibility and rebates? It did. All right. Thank you. So, um, you know, we will refer to these again later on when we're discussing the, the scoping study a little bit, but I just wanted to provide you with this information here. 
Um, these are a list of the rebates for the heat pump incentives. Um, so if you're, if you're looking to put in a standard air source heat pump, the rebate will be $2,500 per ton. Um, for for those aren't that aren't uh, familiar with it, tonnage is the basically the size of the condenser that goes in. Um, in, in your house, you might have a three or four ton unit. In a building the the size of Hopkins Academy, um, you know, for for example, it's it's a, a 200 ton ground source heat pump that is being recommended. So, so for air source heat pumps, it's twenty five hundred dollars per ton. VRF heat pumps, which is a you know a step up in the technology of air source heat pumps, um, is a thirty five hundred dollar per ton. And ground source heat pumps is forty five hundred dollars per ton. And and for example. It was recommended 200 ton, 200 tons for the ground source heat pump. So the, you know, and this is only estimate at this point. We have to, you know, double check the savings after the TA study, and if if it's determined to be cost effective, the ground source heat pump incentive would be approximately nine hundred thousand dollars. And and we can discuss that a little bit more uh, leading on. You know, at at this point, I'd like to to introduce Sarah Ross. Um, Sarah, if you have the ability to to jump on and, and introduce yourself. Yeah, great. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me, Sarah Ross from Undaunted K-12. We're a national nonprofit that's focused on supporting schools to uh, make the transition to uh, zero carbon um, and to prepare young people for what's what's coming in terms of rapidly changing climate. Thanks so much for having me here today. Thanks, Sarah, for um, being here. Yeah, it doesn't look... Let me see if I can... Are you all seeing a screen yet on my side? Let's see. We're not seeing you share your screen yet. Also, may I just say, Sarah, there you are there. We can see your screen. But for folks in the audience who may be looking at a digital agenda and for the school committee members, if you refresh your screen, you can also, Sarah, thank you for just sending this to me. So I now have included it as a link in the agenda. If that's helpful as well, just so Great. we have it with our documents of this meeting. But you will need to refresh your screen in order to see it. Great. And, and Anne, I will, I'll send you the slides that I shared as well that, that you can share with everyone. That'd be very helpful. Thank you. Great. So I know, uh, Umar, do you want to give me a sense of time here? You guys have a very full packed agenda. I can run through this very quickly uh, and skip to a bunch of slides and, you know, still have this material available to you all, but give me some guidance here while, while I'm moving through this. I think that um, the rest of the agenda is pretty light, Annie, and this is really the focus of this meeting. So I would say uh, in light of the um, importance of this topic and the uh, decision that we'll make, I think we should get the full, uh, full report. Okay. Well, thank you so much for having me. We're gonna spend a lot of time together uh, talking about one of the key decisions that you all uh, get to make here in terms of uh, different HVAC replacement options that the scoping study laid out. So um, what I'm doing here is taking information that's available in that scoping report and providing the committee with some additional context that I think is really relevant to help guide this decision. Um, so we're going to get to know this table really well together and we're going to walk through it. Uh, you know, as the superintendent talked about, there's a bunch of different measures to improve the efficiency of the building to reduce costs. But the, one of the major choices you have is how to move from what option you want to move from as you think about replacing your legacy oil system with a new system to keep the school warm and cool uh, and to do so in a cost effective manner. So we're going to run through this together. You know, first, you know, there's a lot of engineering speak in that report, but just to level it up, you basically have two different technologies that the engineers are recommending in various configurations. Um, three of the options are all air source heat pump technologies, and one of them, 2C, is a ground source heat pump technology. These technologies, to compare them with your oil burner, um, have a few key differences to keep in mind. Um, you know, these heat pumps are really the technology of modern heating and cooling because they, they improve on these three dimensions. You know, there's no on-site fossil fuel burning um, associated with this equipment. It's vastly more efficient and it's a two for one. It provides both heating and cooling. So, you know, quite simply from my perspective, this is, these are better mousetraps as they say quite uh, ambiguously. 
And, you know, MSBA just actually, this is your school, but our state school building authority just did a showcase of all the schools around the state that are embracing this technology. So it is becoming more and more prevalent among schools and it is such a great match for schools. So the next column here says, you know, takes the data from that scoping study where they said, you know, how much do we think it would cost? And these, again, are rough estimates to be refined to pursue one of these four different options. Um, so we start with these kind of estimated gross costs, but the world is gonna change when we add in more context quite dramatically. So these are again, numbers that you can find right out of the scoping study. Um, the next piece that Matthew talked about was the incentives that are available through MathSave. Those weren't in the report, but we're gonna start to pull them in here to see kind of a full picture of the story. And again, these are estimated um, based on my understanding of the report, um, uh, basically that tonnage number that we talked about for the size of equipment, the incentive based on the different type of equipment, and then I'm adding on that $62,000 because all of these uh, technologies, all of these choices would allow you, they think, to meet the 40% reduction in carbon emissions, which is very exciting. So some estimated... And rebates from Eversource. Matthew, do you want to jump in? Yeah, if I could jump in real quick. I just I just want to emphasize that these are these are estimated. Um for for these systems that are large and above 150 tons, uh, we we have to do some some uh, BCR test on it, which is a benefit cost ratio analysis. And if it passes that test, then then these would be the expected incentive. But and we would do that analysis after the technical assistance study, which is the next step. Uh, but rough rough analysis, um, it, it shows that these these projects do pass our current BCR as as they're they're stated now. So th it, these this would be a a good estimate of what est of what incentives you could um, get. But but I just want to um, emphasize that these are estimated at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So the next piece, and again, this is a piece that was not part of the context of the report, but is. Um, new as of a year ago, is there are new federal incentives you'll see uniquely available to one of these pieces of equipment, the ground source heat pump. You've also seen it called uh, a ground loop. Uh, there are some other technology, but basically these are all the same pieces of equipment. This ground source heat pump is what I'm calling it here. So let's let's spend a little bit of time because that 1.8 million is you know quite a striking part of the financial calculus here. So just to say a little more about this, and I, we may have talked about this at a previous meeting, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act was a national federal piece of legislation that really creates a substantial funding opportunity for schools across the country and certainly for Hadley Public Schools um, to do this work. Uh, there's, there's a link here, hidden this little hyperlink down here will take you to this piece from the World Resources Institute, which you know details and talks about how the Inflation Reduction Act specifically can help schools do this work. But let, let's apply it here to Hadley Public Schools. Um, the piece that we're gonna apply is called an investment tax credit. This is a policy that has been around for a while, but was newly enhanced by the Inflation Reduction Act. It's the policy that created the solar industry and still continues to promote the solar industry in, in the United States. So it's been a remarkably successful policy and it will now defray uh, up to 50 or 60 percent of the cost of clean energy technologies in schools. Um, this is available until 2033. So we have a long kind of span to do the, these building projects, which do take some time. It is not competitive. So you're not applying for this. If you install the equipment, you get the incentive. Um, and it will be paid to you. This is a new innovation of this Inflation Reduction Act. It will be paid to non-taxable entities as a cash payment through something called direct pay. And the White House has a whole website devoted to this new policy direct pay, which will provide, again, a cash reimbursement, which is important to schools installing these clean energy technologies. Let me stop there for one sec. Are there, are there questions? Uh, this is really exciting. I think I do remember you um, presenting this opportunity to us when we first discussed it. I wonder, in that time, are there examples of schools across the country that have effectively received the reimbursement through direct pay? We're, we're not there yet in terms of just how this is rolling out, because this fall will be the first time that um, this year is the first year where if you install the equipment in 2023, you are eligible for it. 
So awesome. what happens is you install equipment in one tax year, calendar year, if, if that lines up. Um, this fall will be the first time that uh, owners of this equipment can say, I did this and file, do a pre-filing with the IRS. And then next May 2024 will be the first year when um, when you all as non-taxable entities are filing a, a form to say, we installed this equipment and when the IRS is processing them. So this is you know, we're, we're going to be in the first wave of this. You know, there are other communities that are um, that have already installed the equipment in 2023 and they will be, you know, doing this work this fall. So there there will be folks paving the way for you, but we're not we're not there yet to folks that have gotten money. Great. I have one other question, and that is um, if there is a change in administration, will this program potentially be dismantled or is it? definitely, you know, in perpetuity, you know, for the life of this, uh, this program? I mean, this, this is policy, right? So as all things with policy, it is as good as the paper we write it on. Um, I will say again, that this tax credit has now is the basis is the foundation of all of our solar energy, all of our wind industry, you know, this, this is the foundational policy. And now, you know, this, this broader set of technologies it has been around since 2008. It has survived, you know, Republican leadership in, you know, all parts of Congress and in the executive branch. Uh, and a massive amount of the technologies that benefit from this tax credit are actually in red states. So when you think about the politics of this, um, but yes, of course, you know, there have been, there will be continue to be political conversations around uh, this policy. Um, we have seen it again survive all the challenges so far and since 2008. So I, I feel good about the, the staying power of this policy, but as with all policy, it has that risk. Excellent. Thank you, Sarah. Well, well to be clear, to follow up on that, this is federal law, right? This is in the Inflation Reduction Act? Yes. So the law would have to be changed. It's not simply just a change in administration. So that's a, it's a higher hurdle. Indeed. Thank you for the clarification. Great. Thank you. I have. A, I just have a quick question. Yes. Um. So, you're saying it can defray up to fifty to sixty percent, but you know how are we? How are those numbers determined? Right. And how much? You know, I because I, it is a very large number. It's a very uh, large number. <laughs> yeah, that's a I'm great question. Curi- uh, I'm just curious as to you know how. And again, you're giving us estimated costs. So we're not even sure when you say estimated, are we thinking it's going to be higher? Or are we thinking it's going to be lower? Because it, it is yeah. a really large number. Yeah. yeah. Matthew, do you want to? Uh, I, was, I, was, I was just going to say that. So um, the, the engineer who put the report together, he's he's very experienced in the industry. Um, his company went through an RFP for Eversource, and, and we determined that they were capable of doing these kind of reports and to to the best of his knowledge as an energy efficiency engineer um he he estimated the cost so um yes yes they can change but at, at this point with all the information he has and and his experience and knowledge these are these are the numbers that that he came up with for the report and and i see fran has his hand up to to maybe add something in there we've been talking to, hello fran boucher here all, we have several engineering firms that have been doing these studies, and they just the one thing they have said consistently is they've been astounded at the inflation from year to year on the costs of of these mechanical systems. Now, because the economy is slowing up, uh, interest rates have increased. I know I also hear that engineers aren't as busy and mechanical contractors aren't as busy, but it appears the equipment cost is very can be very hard to predict at this time. So th- this is this is the best estimate you can do at this time. But the, the longer it takes to to get this thing designed and committed and sold, you know, there is an opportunity for inflation to work against this. Thank you, Fran. Ryan. Yeah, I just want to add that um, this does pass the sniff test on our end. So we have we've been speaking with um, many entities about the cost of particularly on the geothermal side, on the cost of dollar per ton for um installing geothermal systems, and this was in the range. So it's not wildly off for sure. Great. Thank you. I have a question. Um, so just 
to tie into this kind of estimate piece when, so let's, let's pretend we, we come back in September and we're, we're all for doing the project. Okay. And let's say, you know, we do the entire project. Is that at that point, you know, once you do all the other steps for assessment, do your deeper dive into it. Um, and then we get maybe a little bit more of an accurate number of the estimate based on your findings. Is there a contract that we would sign that would lock in the cost or it might vary once the project starts and you're six months in or a year in and that number changes? So, so Tara, I, I think I might be able to answer this and Fran and Ryan, you can jump in if you have anything to add. So, so Eversource as an entity, we're, we're, we're not forcing you guys into a contract to complete this project. The, the town can, you know, using your own procurement rules, you can go out to bid and, and get the project done. We, we're, we're not going to be the general contractor or the project manager for, for the actual install of the project. So, so that portion would kind of be on the town to manage themselves. I, I can assist you with incentives and, and Sarah can, can talk about uh, the, the tax side of it. And, you know, I, I can reach out to the contractors and, and get statuses and, and move them along. But in the end, uh, the, the town is kind of responsible for, for moving that project along. There's, there is a, an agreement that the town would sign if, if you decide to move forward with the deep energy retrofit plan that basically says, you know, if you complete these uh, energy cost saving measures within three years, we'll pay you an additional $62,000 for the deep energy retrofit plan. But that that's pretty much the only contract between Eversource and, and the town that would exist. Um, if you guys don't complete the project within three years, there's no penalty. Uh, you just you just don't get the additional incentive for that. So I, I hope that answered your question, Tara. Please let me know if, if there's anything else I can address. Thank you, Matthew. I think, Annie, you might have additional thoughts on this. Uh, related, perhaps not specifically, but I think it's helpful. As the school committee is listening to and learning about options of uh, renovating our HVAC system. I just want to remind the public and the school committee that the 10-year plan the school committee passed in August of last year had we had estimated to replace two existing steam boilers and convert to hot water distribution for heating a price point. Again, this was $2022. This was put together, I think, initially in March of 22, $1,896,000. So um it isn't a question of whether the school department will be spending money to upgrade the HVAC system. We had already estimated just that replacement at just under $2 million, just a question of pathway. I just wanted to remind those. Thank you, Annie. And Tara, just I'm cognizant of your question. I think that we would be working with the town to establish whatever contract um, given the choice that we had. And that contract would specify that we lock into certain rates or that there's this amount of wiggle room. We're not there yet, but it would be part of the contract with whichever entity we signed with to do the work or whichever entity the town signed with to do the work. All right, um, back to you, Sarah. Yeah, so that, that was a great tee up to, you know, how do we estimate these incentives? Um, and, and I will note that because these incentives are a percent of the costs, to the extent there are increases in costs, you know, the structure of this policy, you know, kind of rides along with you. It doesn't get eroded by, by inflation. So when I look at the project that we're talking about doing at Hopkins, um, if you were to elect to see the ground source heat pump, uh, knowing this policy the way I do, you all would be eligible for a, a base credit of 30% of the cost. You would likely be able to qualify, and again, you would need to put this in your contracting for an additional 10% bonus for using domestic content. There's a link here, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So, um, And then you would be eligible for an additional 10% because Hopkins is located in what the federal government has designated through this policy as an energy community based on your proximity to the closed Mount Tom coal facility. 
So one of the things that the Inflation Reduction Act did is say, we want to help communities that were uh, closely linked to a fossil fuel economy to transition. And so we're going to include additional dollars. So you all are lucky enough to be within that zone and get an additional 10%. Um, we're not talking about doing a solar or wind project here, and nor are you going to try the land. So that last 10% that's available to some communities, you all don't qualify for. But I see 30 plus 10 plus 10, you know, my estimate is that you would likely be eligible for cash reimbursement of 50% of the cost of a ground source heat pump system. And based on the estimated numbers we've seen that actually um, it puts us in the ballpark of replacing our current systems with traditional fossil fuel burning um, technology. Is that right? Absolutely. I mean, we'll, we'll get to the la one of the next columns, but yeah, we're actually lower <laughs> than the, the cost that the superintendent was just talking about in terms of replacing your legacy equipment with similar legacy equipment. Terrific. So in terms of the domestic content, you know, there are a number of manufacturers of this ground source heat pump equipment that all serve the K-12 market. Here are just three examples, and they're all showing off their uh, case studies that they're, they've done at K-12 schools across the country. Um, so again, in talking with the folks that actually develop these projects, uh, they've all said to me, yeah, we're, we're, we're very confident that we can hit the requirements in terms of domestic content to achieve that additional 10% bonus for our clients. Again, supply chains can change, but again, where we sit today, this is the best information that we have that I'm sharing with you all. And then this is just a quick link to show you just how lucky you are, Hopkins Academy there in that light yellow area. You see none, none of the rest of Western Mass is showing up, but you all are in that strike zone where you get an additional 10% um, for being part of this energy community. And there's the link down here below to the federal government site that you can substantiate that. So that's how we get to that 1.825 million. Um, you know, it's 50% of that gross cost. When we put it together, so I'm taking your the initial cost in column A, I'm subtracting off the incentives from uh, mass save in column B, and then I'm subtracting off the incentive we just went over from the Inflation Reduction Act, and you'll see a net cost here. Uh, I want to know that for the first two pathways, while they are improvements and introduce new technologies, they are not sufficient to um, be able to completely turn off your oil system. So those first two options would actually also require you to invest uh, in repairing your current oil system. And as the superintendent just mentioned, you know, that's to the tune of $1.8 million. Um, so uh, not being an engineer, I didn't put those costs in there myself, but, but just to give you some reminder that it's not really $618,000 and you're done. It's that plus the cost to repair your current oil system because you're still going to need both. Option C and D really take over the job for you. And they say, we're going to, we're going to install enough equipment here to completely turn off the fossil fuel equipment that, that we might still need. Um, and so those you kind of can move ahead just with the cost of those two pieces of equipment. So you're seeing the net cost there of 863,000 after we take off the, um, the two very rich incentives. Clearly, you know, uh, the, the incentives are pushing decision makers to, to make the ground source heat pump option choice. And uh, if I could just jump in for one second and, and talk about that a little further, Sarah. Um, so options 2A and 2B um, listed on there that, as Sarah mentioned, you will, you will have to continue to use fossil fuels in that, in that uh, scenario if you choose to move down that pathway. Um, and, and one thing this report um, doesn't take into account is the the societal cost of carbon. Um, so continuing to use fossil fuels, there is an additional cost um, to you know people's health, to the environment that that isn't factored into this report either. So so I just wanted to to put that out there for for everyone's knowledge. Speaking and, of that, Matthew, did I hear that there are some communities that actually put a cost on that and that that will be sort of a required thing for all entities to actually put that into their income state or their balance sheet? Can you tell yeah. us more about that? Yeah, there is um, a, it's called Birdo and it's the, the greater Boston area at the moment. And, and yeah, so it looks like Sarah does have a slide prepared for it. 
Uh, but yes, they're they're doing it in Boston now. There is talk of expanding it statewide, but but there's 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 nothing hard on paper that the rest of the state will have to follow this anytime soon. Although it is probably going to be expanded at some point in the future. So so I'll, I'll let Sarah discuss it a little bit more. Yeah, okay. I mean, the, the background. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I, I don't want you to go out of flow. So whenever <laughs> you're ready to present it. Well, no, we're, we're here. Um, the, right, the background here is that we've a, we're a state that's made a commitment to reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. Buildings are 38.5% of our estimated statewide emissions. So the state understands it needs to have a plan to reduce the emissions coming from buildings. There are two policies that would work well together that are under active consideration right here. And you're seeing links to the um, legislative proposals in this current legislative session that would introduce new costs to send these price signals um, to the marketplace. And, you know, as, as we were talking about here, one of the, oops, one of the, um, one of the uh, policies is currently in place in the Boston area. So if you're in the Boston area right now, and you're a school that is the size that Hopkins is, um, come 2025, I believe is the first year of compliance, given the emissions that your building um, produces right now, you would be facing an annual cost of $83,000 and 70, 83, yeah, about $83,000 per year. The, that cost, my guess would be likely to ramp up. And again, you have to think about this over the 20 to 30 year lifespan of this piece of equipment. So these compliance costs would end up being substantial. Again, this is if this policy, which is already in, in Boston and other parts of the country were expanded across the state as this legislative proposal seeks to do. I think whether it's this number or some other number, the smart money is not that Massachusetts will take no action on building missions. If you were being conservative, if you were being you know careful, you would say mm, bets are that you know the state is going to introduce some policy to move in the direction of compliance with our climate law as a state, and so uh, rather than put in zero, uh, which would be a dangerous assumption, you know, it, it makes sense to put in something. So we haven't even put that in in the numbers, but this is this is looming out there as a possibility. And just to um, to really spell it out schools in the Boston area would have to actually pay their local at present their local town or their ultimately their state this amount of money approximate 83,000 in order to uh to um compensate for the fact that it's using 355 metric tons of CO2 a year is that true but we haven't seen compliance happen yet. So I think this is, you know, uh, this is just still a theoretical because this is starting, I believe, in 2025. Um, if you look at this, look on the link on this blog post, you'll see kind of the um, the policy laid out in more detail. And you'll see the, the thresholds, which I looked at and saw that, you know, Hopkins is over the threshold that they say for schools starting that first compliance year. Um, but we had not seen this happen yet. But this is, again, my understanding of how the policy is going to function. Great. Thank you. OK, so let me see if I can go back here. So um, so, yeah, from looking at these different estimated costs to install, you know, from my perspective, the ground source heat pump is clearly the winner. Again, you have to believe and trust in the um, in the, the, the federal incentives. It looks like Ryan has his hand raised. Yeah, Sarah, I just want to make another point on the, the ground source heat pump. The, the bulk of the cost for a ground source heat pump is drilling the well fields, and those well fields will last longer than the uh, any of the uh, heat pump equipment that we're talking about. So yeah. when it comes time to, to update that system even, you already have the well fields in place, and so the cost will be much lower than um, installing it the first time. It's true. We don't even have the cost of maintaining these systems through time. But but Ryan is making a great point that these systems are um, the majority of the work is work that you do once and, and last for many decades. Unlike the 1.8 million that we would need to replace the boilers today. So it, it in theory, it would be a smaller uh, investment for upkeep down the line. Yes, that is certainly the idea. OK, very good. Thank you. The, the next part that we that was included in the report, so I can just highlight here as part of the context, 
is the energy savings just to operate these machines um, estimated in the report, you know, showing us that uh, if you choose the ground source heat pump option as the most efficient machine, you know, you're going to save $25,000 a year just on your energy costs to operate these pieces of equipment. So that's what the report again estimated. So it's the one that's going to save you the most from an energy operating cost perspective. So lowest first costs, lowest operating costs. Um, yes, yeah, certainly the idea that this is has lower, broader maintenance costs. So across all these dimensions, you know, 2C is looking very, very good. And did you want to jump in? Yeah. Yeah, may I? Um, just to help folks uh, in the public, the school committee may not uh, need this additional information, but I want folks who are looking at this in the public to understand when they're looking at the scoping study and that table, I believe it's on page six because I'm looking at your slides now. And there's a column that um, they'll see in some cases numbers in red and it refers to electricity. So would you mind clarifying that that's not actually an increase in dollar cost, what that refers to, just so people understand as you're talking about decreased overall cost in operation. I don't want someone down the road to say I'm going by the column. Yeah, yeah. So there's a few things going on. Yeah. So yeah, the report does talk about the increase in electricity usage, because again, these are machines that are driven from electricity. So we're moving away from burning oil, and instead we are going to increase our electricity usage. So that report points out yeah, you're going to be using a lot more electricity to run these machines. That's the point, right? We want to be switching electricity, which we can make cleanly, and that our utilities are increasingly making more clean. Um, and so we are going to increase our, our electricity usage, but that's um, the cost. We're, we're being more efficient in the machines that we're operating, and we're avoiding all the cost to buy oil. So when you net that out, you're actually saving money on your, your energy cost to operate and again, keep your building warm and cool. And, and does that help? really drive, yeah, to just drive this point home, um, I just don't want people confused on when they're looking at table two, electric uh, savings, that's in kilowatt hours. Those aren't dollars. Energy cost savings are in dollars. I just want people right. aware of what they're um, uh, yeah. looking at. So it's not a increase in electrical costs in terms of dollars, you're not looking at an increase of $179,000. That's usage kilowatt hours of the other columns referring to dollars. Right, right. Thank you. Great. Um, so we talked about, you know, the these different systems and whether they would still require onsite burning of fossil fuels. The first two, because you still need your oil system. Yes, the last two, you know, we're moving completely into an all electric world. We talked about why that's important. Um, and then the last stage here is, is just to talk about um, uh, whether it's providing building wide cooling. You know, your classrooms have cooling now. There are other sections of your building that don't. Um, options 2C and 2C, 2C and 2D would provide the whole building with cooling, which you know, is becoming increasingly important as we have more heat waves that are more intense, lasting for longer. So here are, you know, several steps um, from the metropolitan area, certainly as an urban area, you know, they, they're they facing it much more intensely and now, but um, even out in Western Mass. Uh, and then talking about, you know, kind of the this experience of school closures because of extreme heat. We're starting to see teachers unions across the country start to bargain around um, comfortable indoor environments, particularly because of extreme heat. So uh, for that reason, also, you know, these these choices are actually not apples to apples along this dimension. You're getting a fundamentally different and improved and more resilient building when you extend cooling to the whole of your Hopkins facility. Um, I have a question on this point and then Fran, um, you can go next. The question I have is about the, um, yes, extreme heat is only going to get worse. We're also seeing um, air quality as something that's really important. <clears throat> of course, during the pandemic, we invested in um, uh, air filtration systems that kept um, the the air inside the school um, free of uh, COVID-19. Um, mm -hmm. But we also have, we're seeing now the uh, effects of 
more and more forest fires and air quality as a result of those forest fires, you know, h- harming um, cities and, and states that are not near those uh, areas. Um, certainly, we saw the effects of that earlier this year. So does this technology, you know, the 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 um, systems that we're seeing, does it have an impact on the air quality in the schools? Um, you know, I want to I want to understand what the investment is in the air quality for our young, um, our youngest people in Hadley um, and being protected for most of the hours that they'll be spending um, during their lives. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So I'm, I'm happy to take a stab at that. And again, I will say I'm not an engineer or a building scientist. This is my understanding as a late person of this world. So Again, burning fossil fuels on site um, degrades your local air quality, right? So um, when you're burning those fossil fuels, it's it's around in the air. And then that outside air, because these systems are vented, can, you know, and does come back in as your, your air systems are pulling in outdoor air. Um, never mind when your kids are outside on fields around the school building, they're experiencing that local air pollution. So moving from, you know, removing that source of local air pollution will be a good thing. You will still contend with, as you're pointing out, as we're seeing more and more like forest fires in California affecting our air all the way here on the East Coast. And so for that, we need to think about a building that is very tight, where we are controlling the air that comes in and we're filtering that air that comes in. So one of the moves that will happen as we move from um, this legacy equipment that, you know, uh, was eight was what they call high velocity. So you're burning fossil fuels. It's an intense heat. It kind of blasts out in the buildings that we live in and uh, go to school in. And our buildings were not necessarily very tight. So that heat would like leak out of our buildings, Swiss cheese buildings, right? What we do when we move to uh, a heat pump system, this is what's called a low velocity system where it's not blasting hot air at you, but it's actually oozing warm or cool air into the building, we need a much tighter building envelope for that. You know, this report said that you will, um, that you have good windows that you replaced recently, but I wouldn't be surprised if there's more work that's going to make sense to do to make that building really tight. So when we're oozing our hot air in there from this new equipment, it doesn't leak out. The benefit of that from an air quality perspective is that outside smoky air isn't going to infiltrate because now we've made this your shell your, of your building, right? Your exterior has just really high integrity and we can control and filter the air that does come in, right? So we can install equipment that pulls in outdoor air as it's needed based on occupation level, occupant level. So lots of people, lots of carbon dioxide. Ooh, we need some fresh air in here. And we can put a MER 14 filter in that equipment, which is the level of filter that we need that you all probably talked about in discussions during COVID that level of filter will filter out things like wildfire smoke. So now we're controlling the air that comes into the building because we have a really tight shell and we're filtering it to make sure that um, young people in Hopkins are not breathing air that has wildfire smoke or other particulate matter in it. Thank you, Sarah. All right, over to you, Fran. And then, uh, Christine, do you have a question directly related to this? Yes, I just... I guess I'm just looking at this in terms of there's no doubt that this is a much better system. It's more efficient. My concern is just the dollar and cents of the incentives, what the actual costs are going to be and how it's going to disrupt um, the school year, how it's going to disrupt the town, you know, in terms of we're about to put up a, you know, we're we're spending all this money on fields. And then I'm looking, I'm looking at like, sort of diagrams of how they do this and you're talking about drilling and or you know putting down piping are we are are we going to end up destroying the field or having to redo the fields after all the construction is done so my concern is not the actual process because it's it's obviously much healthier more efficient and i get all that um so for me it's more about the how we can how is this going to be done Who's going to be doing it? That kind of thing. So I don't want it to, you know, I'm, I think that the the ground sourcing is, uh, it's, it's a great option. I'm just looking at the logistics. That's all. Sure. Christine, I'll, I'll jump in there and, and try to take a stab at this question. So 
A, a lot of your questions that you're proposing right now, I think will be answered in the next step, which is the, the deeper technical assistance study. Um, we can put together a list of the, of the questions and concerns the town has and give those to the engineers that are going to be doing the study. And, and we can make sure they address your concerns ahead of time and, and you know, work around you know, their, their experience working with schools, they know, you know, we, we're not going to bother the kids from eight to three on a weekday. Um, you know, they can come after three, they can work during the summer. Um, and, and that can all be addressed in the technical assistance study. And Chris, I just chime in. I think the fields that we're looking at would be the one behind the gym. So we're not currently planning on redoing those. So it wouldn't go on the, on, under the fields that are currently being renovated. That's that all needs to be scoped out, as Matthew said. Good point. And and actually, this is the, between the technical study as well as scoping out which engineering firm and doing the bid and all. We're talking about a multi-year approach, and so it's it. This is just it. it seems it seems like a really long timeline, but uh, we need it's it's we're taking a long road to to do this. Yeah. And the, the cost for the technical assistance study, uh, whatever that cost is, it's going to be a cost share between the town and Eversource. So Eversource um, usually will pay 50% of the technical assistance studies. For municipal customers like yourself, um, there's some additional funds and Eversource will pay 70% of the cost of TA studies. And do we have an idea of what the ballpark is for that cost? Uh, that's question number one. And question number two, I think, was directed towards any or anyone else who was at the um, the town green committee. They have a certain pot of money that they might be eligible for due to becoming a green community. Does that pot of money apply to this kind of technical assistance? Uh, I think I can answer the first question there, Humera. Um, so the the cost of the study, it would really kind of depend on which which project you decide to move forward with. Like the ground source heat pump probably would be more expensive than uh, two way the air source heat pump covering partial of the building. But you know, a quick rough estimate for the the ground source heat pump study, maybe about um, thirty thousand dollars. So if the town is covering thirty percent of that. Uh, do some quick math there, and you know, roughly ten thousand dollars on the town and twenty thousand uh, dollars ever source would pay. You know, not exact math there, but but just an idea. Quite quite reasonable dollars. And in response to the question about the climate change committee in town and the designation of Hadley as a green community at that first meeting, I believe initially they have access to roughly one hundred thousand um, dollars. That. Uh, that meeting, the focus was on, this is not all the money, it's the first batch of funding that's available. They're looking to focus on increasing energy efficiency in some other town buildings. And they did ask the schools to evaluate uh, opportunities for better weatherization. At this point, um, as in a conversation that I had previously with Sarah and Matt, probably we will need a tremendous amount of money for that. So that first batch of money will most likely be used for other buildings in town, but there are other, um, there'll be additional funding made available. Great, thank you. Uh, Fran. Yeah, just when you're dealing with ground source heat pumps, one uh, cost comes up that's uh, unique, and that is putting in test wells. Then you need to get an idea of how much heat the uh, ground can take out of these systems and it varies from site to site. So the way they do that is they have to actually drill a, a pretty deep well <clears throat> to test that out. And so you'll have, a, there's some cost for the TA study. There's also going to be obviously a design engineer is going to have to design the whole system, but he's not going to be able to put together a design document that, to, to go out to bid until he knows how many wells are required, which is going to require the test well. And I, I don't have a good handle on that, the cost of that, but it's an, it's an additional factor that needs to be considered at some point. <clears throat> And we would consider those factors after the technical assistance. After the technical assistance study, right? There'll be that, so there'll be some, um, still be some variability in the cost on the on the um, or uncertainty of the exact cost on the TA study because uh, 
just, just from that simple reason alone is that, that we can't be, we won't, we won't know exactly how many wells you need and the wells are, are quite expensive. But every study gets us closer to the truth. Oh, that's a, absolutely correct. Yes. And not discouraging you, but just letting you know that the ground source heat pump is a wonderful thing. And I think it's a great idea for the school. It's just, um, it comes with some a little extra effort. Indeed. Thank you. All right, Sarah, back to you. I mean, that that's really the culmination. So I just, I want to um, make sure that I say explicitly that I think this is a phenomenal, that you are a phenomenal, this school is a phenomenal candidate for making this transition. You guys are talking about it at the right time, given the facilities that you have so far. You have, you've prepared to make investments in your HVAC system. So this is not coming, you know, you're, you're not flat footed where you have a piece of equipment that's breaking on you overnight. You guys are thinking about this in advance. You are, you know, phenomenally well positioned from a federal incentive point of view, being an energy community and, uh, you know, MassSave is prepared to provide an extraordinary amount of support for this project. So I'm really excited about you all as a candidate to do this leading work. And I think it will set the school up for, you know, many decades of healthy, um, at low cost, you know, uh, uh, low maintenance system going forward. So I'm, I'm really excited for this to move forward and excited to provide whatever support I can to the district moving forward. Thank you, Sarah. I think it's a really exciting opportunity to be leading again, as Hadley likes to do. Um, and I think all the data points us in the direction of, uh, further exploration of the more robust technologies. Paul. Yeah, I second that, Humera. Um, well said. And and Sarah, thank you so much. That was a really great presentation, really summarized it really well. And thank you, Matthew and the Eversource team for all the background. I, you know, there's one thing to remind folks is we essentially did this through for the elementary school. Years ago, we did the air source heat pumps to revise it, to give it both heating and cooling. If you remember that building was originally built without cooling. Um, I've heard really great things about those system. We just installed many splits here, air source heat pumps in our house, they're, they're fabulous. So this is essentially a similar system. You're just capturing energy, not in the air, you're capturing it underground uh, and transferring it to the building. So I'm all in support, uh, especially given the great support from member source. <laughs> and then ultimately the, federal and state incentives let's let's explore what ground source heat pumps look like i will say again we we you know we we're getting accustomed to those fields being um renovated uh, so now would actually be a good time i would hope that actually we could do this once we test it and, and install it in one season right we did do the air source heat pumps in the school in a pretty short order right and um, we've got a great contracting expert and chris with us so he's getting very experienced at dealing with fields work. So we'll just give Chris another fields project that I'll love to do, but I, I'm all in support of moving forward with the, with the study. Thank you, Paul. Annie. Yes, I hope I'm not overstepping here, Humera, but I did just want to say aloud again, some kind of next steps for school committee members, if that's all right. And I'm not ending the conversation, but I just don't want to forget to remind so as you had said, Humera, the goal today is not to choose and to vote. This is a, a lot of information to digest. Um, but also in keeping with open meeting law, I would ask that school committee members, as you already have, review this discussion, review all of the documents you have, including the original 10-year plan and what we were prepared to extend. And then in September, um, and I would encourage constituents and community members to reach out directly to your individual school committee members, or you can contact me or Chris with any questions you might have or feedback you'd like them to consider. The school committee would then, um, I'm hoping, be prepared to deliberate so that individual members could say what they're thinking and what their recommendations are at that September meeting. There also will be a chance for public comment at the regular September meeting for the public and I would also encourage school committee members as they're thinking through what they would like to recommend, because Matt said that some questions will be answered in a technical assistance um, that phase. If people could be thinking about the questions like Chris, you had a number of really good questions that be prepared to revisit those at that September 25th meeting so we can capture those, include them, and make sure we keep them. Thank, thank you, Ann. And um, Sarah, if you could do me a favor and pull back up that chart with the uh, ECM2s on there, I just wanted to to point out one more thing and, and just kind of discuss something in the report that might 
might be a little confusing to somebody reading it. So, so options 2A and 2B there, um, they do not re completely remove fossil fuels from the site. And, and someone might ask, you know, why is Eversource providing a report that you don't remove all the fossil fuel sites? And, and I'll, and I'll bring you back to the, the beginning of the meeting where I discussed the, the deep energy retrofit plan. The, the intentions of the deep energy retrofit plan are to reduce the fossil fuel, the greenhouse gas emissions on site by at least 40%. And 2A and 2B get you to that 40% reduction. And uh, you may or may not have read it, but on page seven of the report, the engineer who wrote the report actually put together um, a paragraph that states, you know, the made a recommendation basically. And his recommendation, uh, he called it the most feasible path forward, feasible path forward toward um, the 40% greenhouse gas reductions was to do all of the other measures and 2A. And 2A, that would leave fossil fuels on sites. He made that recommendation without taking into account the Eversource incentives, without taking into account the federal incentives. Um, so, so he put that report together, made that recommendation on the quickest way to get to 40% greenhouse gas reductions. Uh, but I think once you look at the numbers, once you see the federal and mass save incentives, you know. And, and I don't want to make any decisions for the town. I just want to provide you guys with the best information possible and let the town make their own decisions. But but 2C does look really good on paper at the moment. And also may I add to that, he would not have taken into consideration uh, the potential for future costs to towns and to towns, the town pays uh, the bills for continuing the the Potential potential legislation that Sarah pointed out that was not taken into consideration. That our actual the cost of fossil fuels could increase for reasons in addition to the cost of the resource itself. Really good point, Andy. Thank you, Matthew. Paul, picking up on that, Matthew, was there an inflationary cost of fuel considered in that report? I couldn't find one. Uh, I I don't see it mentioned in the report as well. Uh, that might be a good question for Fran or. Um, or, yeah, I could take, yeah, typically no. Typically we're just looking at today's cost on, on these studies. It's, it's high level. Okay, thanks. And so if if the ground source heat pump, say we, we talked about it persisting for decades, say 20 years to be conservative, you were assuming, or the, I'm sorry, the report was assuming a stagnant cost, uh, the same cost 20 years from now of fuel that we pay today. Correct. It's just simple. Okay. Payback. Gotcha. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Paul. Christine. I was just curious about on here, um, the only other thing I had a question about was the, it says, you know, cost to repair current oil system. What about the upkeep on the air source or the heat source? I'm sorry, ground source. Thank what you. is that? I think Fran was discussing that earlier. Fran, yes. did you want to recap a bit about the maintenance costs on ground source heat pumps? Well, the, there's the maintenance cost on all systems, of course. And you're going to have, one of the things that was mentioned here was um, the fact that this system would be more distributed. They would be blasting air was the term used from a few central sources and would be able to do better job with air quality because we'll have more filters around the building. Well, there you go, right there. <laughs> you know, you, you've got more maintenance because you're, you're doing more filtering to more devices that are more distributed around the building. And also a boiler is a pretty um, simple device by comparison to a compressor, uh, a refrigeration compressor. So you're, you're going to have some, uh, you know, higher cost, potentially higher cost annual maintenance on the um, uh, num numerous heat pump units you can have around the building versus two big boilers. So yeah, it's, it's, I don't have exact numbers, so I don't know if it's more, more or less, it's, it's likely to be a little bit on the higher side, but I don't, I don't have those numbers. But and, should, and, I'm sorry, but it should be offset by the estimated savings. You're, well, you're going to be saving on some fossil fuel, right? And um, mm -hmm. and you're also going to be getting 
you're, you're getting something for it too, right? You're getting better air quality. That doesn't come for free. I mean, there's, 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 a, there's a cost to, to, to that, but that's a, it's, it's worth it, right? I mean, that's, that's, but we have, this gives us the opportunity to improve the air quality, but then we have to have the, the filters, the more potentially more expensive filters and, and, and ch change them more frequently or so, or have more of them in the building. So those are all things that could be flushed out in, yeah. if, if necessary in the TA study. Uh, I think they're, they're, there are things to consider, but the smaller end of the spectrum in terms of the cost, the capital cost, I think, is really the, the the big the big number here. Of course, that was going to be my question: was whether the technical assistance study would take a, uh, a further educated guess towards the maintenance costs of such a system. We don't typically, but I mean that's something we can we we can do some homework on. It's something we should be able to ever so should be able to share with customers anyway, so we can we can do some homework on that. Thank you. I think that would be smart. Matthew, did you have an additional um, point to make about that? No, I was I was going to basically echo uh, what has already been said that you know we we can have the TA study uh, further flesh out those numbers for you, Christine. Okay, thank you. So, Annie, I have a question for you about um, our procedural pathway forward. We definitely are going to um, make a final decision, or you know, at least a um, a decision on which of these options. Um, we want to pursue at the September meeting, but I wonder, given if the technical assistance study only costs ten thousand, and it would give us much greater um, clarity on this pathway, whether it makes sense to proceed along that path and authorize the that study to get started at least, so that we are closer to answers. Um, before moving forward. So I see what you're saying. One option is to wait until September. The school committee says, I think we should proceed with this path and then um, proceed with the technical assistance study. But based on the conversation that we've had today, it sounds like, and this does not mean that the school committee is voting to move forward with this capital project. I want to be very clear. The technical assistance study, and if I'm mistaken, Eversource, please jump in, the technical assistance study in no way obligates the school committee or town to proceed with any of the recommendations that are delineated in that study. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. And at, at no point is there ever a requirement from Eversource or MassSave that you have to move forward with any project. Um, okay. And so, yeah, I, I just want to really uh, underscore this for the public. So to your point, uh, Humera, I think what you're saying is there are a lot of questions. People are interested in that 2C option for a lot of questions. Um, and does it make sense to ask for the technical assistance study to focus on that option so that the school committee can have more information in order to make a decision going forward? Is that what you're requesting to potentially authorize the TA now with 2C? as the focus of that? I'm I'm wondering out loud whether that would make sense for us to do, and I'm looking for some uh, thoughts from my, my colleagues on that. How long does that study take? Is it a question that I have? Um, because I definitely want to move forward and, you know, uh, I, I don't want to hold up the getting of the study to, you know, move down the path either. So it might be Pennywise pound foolish. I just want to put that out there. So Maybe before you answer this, Matt, because you might be, I'm sorry to interrupt, but when, when you're talking about this, um, the, the second step, this technical study, um, does it limit us to choosing one pathway? Or are you able to look at multiple pathways? Or is it at that point, we have to choose one pathway? Uh, to, to answer your question first, Tara, um, you know, if the town wants to do it, so I think each one of those projects there, 2A, B, C, and D, would be a different technical assistance study with with an associated different cost. Thank so I mean, if the town wanted to move forward with multiple TA studies to, to further flesh out these ideas, that's that's perfectly acceptable. But there would there would be an additional cost per study. So if you wanted to just focus on 2C, there would just be the cost associated with that. And and you kind of mentioned time frame. And if I can figure it out, I would like to, to jump back to the DER overview and show that back up there. 
And again, we are we are here at the decision to continue forward to the TA study. And the, the TA study phase is expected to take about four to five months. Okay. Um, thank you for that. So can I say something, I guess, before you, or unless you have something you want to lead? Um, I, I'm, I'm actually thinking that we should perhaps give it a month and then make a decision as to which of the four pathways we want to further investigate and then authorize the study at that time so that we can begin the, the clock on that four to five months next month. I know you have a question, Tara, but can I also say there's a technical thing you'd have to solve anyways, is that even if you decided now that you said, I want to authorize a study, I still have to think through if you're trying to get questions into the study that probably should be publicly deliberated. Um, so to your point, Humara, there, that that piece would still have to be figured out. Very good. Um, and I didn't really have a question, just rather as hearing Matt kind of um, explain and answer the, the two questions between you and I, Humera, that I actually have a preference to wait till September because Sarah had um, a fantastic presentation, but there's a lot of links on there that I'm not, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I haven't gone through them and I'd really like to go through them and really understand because I, I see when we look at this chart, like, yeah, 2C is like, well, that's a, that's a no brainer, but I'd really like to go through and understand before I make a recommendation or, or where I'm going to support um, and then be able to talk to the community members as to why I did that. I want to make sure I, I read through every possible, right, to make sure that it's really the right decision. It looks appealing right now, but I really, and thank you, Sarah, for preparing um, that report with with all those links in there, because I, I was kind of wondering about federal, and maybe I could have Googled it and found it, but I'm appreciative that you put it right in front of us. Um, so that's really helpful for us to look through to make sure that, yeah, this really is the right way to go. And thank you, Matt, for putting the presentation, answering all the questions. And so, yeah, I agree. I, I personally think we should wait because there's a lot that we need to review now after this meeting, in my opinion. Yeah, I just want to let everyone know that I know you guys have a lot of, you know, official uh, town meeting rules that you have to follow and, and procurement rules and stuff. But I I am available to answer questions anytime you guys would like, uh, whether that's through email, whether that's on a phone call or, or a virtual call. I can even come in person if that's easy enough for you guys. But uh, with with respect to your official meeting rules, you know, reach out to me anytime. I'm 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 happy to answer questions. Thank you, Matthew. All right. Um, thank everyone for this um, this session. Um, the presentations by Matthew and Sarah and supporting um, uh, thoughts from Fran, Ryan, and the, the rest of the team. Um, this is a really interesting and exciting opportunity. Um, please um, share this with colleagues and, and constituents um, so that we can have a full discussion uh, in September um, and decide which pathway we'd like to pursue. Um, and uh, let's move on to the next item of the agenda, which is getting close to the end. Actually, this is the last item on the agenda. And Annie, we have executive session that we wanted to do. That should be quick. Yeah. It not. is not, it's not the last item on the agenda. Okay. Uh, we have some options here. I, they are relatively straightforward uh, agenda items, but I think because you've seen the information in advance, that we could move through rather efficiently at any Let's. time you could stop and say move it to the 28. Um, yeah, I apologize but, all. I, I do have to ring off, but thank you for the really fruitful conversation. Thanks all. Thank you, Paul. You still have a quorum if Chris and Tara and Humera, if they're available, I think I can get through several of these things pretty efficiently if that works for folks. Okay. The calendar. As you can see, we accidentally put the half day on Thursday the 4th in April. It should be on April 5th. That does require a motion for us to post an updated calendar. Move to make the switch to uh, the 5th, not the 4th of April. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, motion passes. The following motions, one, special education teacher job description, Celia Snow, revised description based on changing needs. It's been reviewed by the attorney and the job description you see there is recommended by the attorney and the director of special education.
application. It's not a new position, a revised description. I just have a really quick question about it. Why we're spelling out ASD in particular. Um, in terms of, I'm sorry, this has to do with um, the kind of experience that we want folks to have. So we absolutely want to make sure that someone who's applying for this position, uh, if their experience, let's say, was predominantly or strictly working with students who qualify under severe emotional disturbance and they don't have any experience with ASD, um, that our preference is that um, we, we want people to have that experience. All right. And that, I mean, all experience is specialized, but we're hoping for specialized knowledge of this. Do I hear a motion to approve the change in the job description? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Uh, aye. All right. Similarly, you. the next two job descriptions, Kelly Bryant, Director of Food Services, uh, made some adjustments based on these for next year. The attorney has reviewed both. One is a six-hour cafe position. One is a four-hour cafe position. Can you highlight the ways in which this these uh, positions have changed? Uh, certainly. So predominantly, um, the qualifications have we the qualifications have stayed the same. We make sure that um, all of our ADA language, so things with physical demands, have been moved to qualifications in addition to ADA language at uh, at the back end of the end. Um, and um, we've added uh, some responsibilities around assisting the cook with meal preparation as needed. Um, it's probably the biggest change there. Okay, thank you. Do I hear a motion to approve these two job changes? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? All right. Aye. Aye. All right, motion Great. passes. Okay, these MOAs. In the past, this is just a new recommendation from the attorney. The chair would sign off on these MOAs. There is nothing new here. So our high school counselor worked some time during the summer. That MOA has been in effect since before I arrived here 10 years ago. Um, and the pre-K director has received a stipend. What the attorney has recommended is that when an MOA, which means this is not something that is delineated in the collective bargaining agreement that the school committee and the union president has signed, but it's something that is in addition to what is specified in the agreement. If that um, if that creates a uh, a financial liability of any kind for the district, that the entire school committee should vote on it. So again, nothing new here. Pre-K director and the counselor have had these roles. It's just that rather than the school committee chair signing each year, the entire school committee should. Do I hear a motion to accept the new memorandum of agreement? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Uh, these are the policy, bullying, prevention, and intervention plan. This is a second reading. If you recall, Chris and Ethan took folks through these policies when after they discussed them. We had a first reading. This is now the second reading. And for approval, nothing has changed since your first reading. Thank you uh, to the policy committee for um, reviewing these policies. Um, I think they're uh, solid and well-written. Um, do I hear a motion to approve uh, these two policies? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. And thank Aye. you again to policy. Uh, next one. Uh, annually, and the school committee chair signs off on these. I believe I brought this to your attention last year. Particularly important now, we'll have an on-site review coming up. The IDEA conditions of assistance that we have to sign, that we have to say that I have reviewed these, which I did with the leadership team. Celia and I went over them with the building principals at a meeting last week of the leadership team. And we have to sign off every year that we're aware of the federal requirements under IDEA. Uh, I can assure you that we comply with all of the IDEA requirements that are delineated in the conditions of assistance. After the school committee votes, I'll bring this next week for our signature or we'll get an electronic signature. Does this need a vote, Annie? Um, no, I'm sorry. Thank you. You don't need a vote. I just want to make sure that you folks that were on record as you folks have this to review 
and that you have reviewed it. Um, and then the final bit, and we may before not move, even, sorry, Before you move on, I, item yeah. K, that document is not accessible. Um, can you open up the um, access for us and for the public? Yeah, I sure can. Thank you very much. And I don't know why that isn't. Um, so, okay, just do this quickly. And sorry about that. Anyone with the link? Done. Uh, it's changed the settings. If you refresh, I apologize. You should be able to see that. No, okay. no. And so what you see in each one of those numbered things is the obligations under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, what I'm responsible for, what the district is responsible for, we adhere to these. So the components of a team, least restrictive environment, we adhere to these. Use of funds. And then annually, the school committee chair, Chris and I, are required to sign this document every year, this assurance document. This is just to bring it to the attention of the school committee. This is definitely a very long document. Um, might I suggest that we um, have the month until the end of September to sure. review this? Sure. Thank you. Yep, no problem. So if people can ask questions, thank you. I'll put that on the September agenda. Uh, and um, the final thing, I'm requesting that the school committee consider appointing a liaison. Uh, there is some interest in updating the Hadley Elementary School playground equipment. There are two sets of equipment. Um, and because we are, I know that Jen is very interested in getting parent input and community input. This will also require interacting with the town, asking questions of the attorney. Uh, if possible, I would request that a school committee liaison be assigned to that to help, just like we have Chris for capital and Paul for fields. I, I'd be happy to do the playground. Um, um, if I might interject, I'm sorry. I was going to ask if I could do it. I did start conversations. Okay. If that's okay with you. Um, no, that's fine. Cool. A couple different people did approach me about it. And so um, I didn't want to start any official work in any capacity um, before talking with you guys. But if, if, if nobody objects, I did have people reach out to me already, if that's okay. Um, okay. And it would be you have young children who are presently using um, those play structures. And you're, I believe you're also involved in the Friends of Hadley preschool community. Um, that kind of reach is valuable for parent input into the playground project. And they happen to be the people who've started that discussion. Um, and so um, I think my goal would be able to act as the middle, well, as a liaison, as the middle person. So anything pertinent that needs to come back to school committee for review and discussion and input would, would be where I would bring that back. If that's okay with you, Chris. Of course. And trust me, Chris, you will be wicked busy based on the previous presentation with Capital. <laughs> That's what I can tell based on our previous discussion. Great. All right. Okay. Perfect. So, Do we Tara, to... you don't need to, if, Do need I don't to think you need to back. vote that, that if you as the chair simply agree to appoint Tara as that liaison, that works really well for me. Tara, um, I agree to appoint you as the um, playground project school committee liaison. Thank you. Thank you both. Perfect. Um, I can say here, and truly, at any point, three of you can say, no, the only reason we would need to go into executive, if you specifically would like to know the placement, because we would have to come out of executive to vote the topic. Um, and so the discussion is that we, we had originally, uh, you approved security cameras for both buildings. Um, so you originally, the school committee approved the installation of security cameras at both buildings, the Bricotta security cameras. We have completed that installation. And at the time, the quote or proposal was roughly $135,000 of equipment to cover both of the schools and all the additional equipment that included a 10-year license as well. At that time, the school committee approved for installation for the purchase of the equipment and installation not to exceed the cost of the equipment itself. To date on the project, we've expended 
about $166,000 on the project. And as would, which is pretty normal, after installing all of the cameras, we've now identified where we may have, where we have blind spots. And so to address the blind spots and the input on the blind spots. So again, um, the input on the blind spots, I'm not going to say, which is what would be a topic for executive, precisely where every camera would be placed. That's, that's um, not public information. But I can tell you that input came from both principals as well as public safety conversations with our director of technology here, our, our IT director in the district. So with that information, Steve Bigda went to our vendor, and in order to address the issues in the blind spots, the total cost for equipment installation and a 10-year license that would match the license we have on existing equipment is roughly $30,000. It's just over $28,000. I think it would be exact, excuse me, of what that is, um, the cost. And so the school committee would need to vote on um, if we would be authorized to use up to that amount of school choice money uh, to purchase in order to pay for additional cameras and installation to address the line spots. Let me just pull up the exact amount for you. If um, So all of that is what we would vote on in public session. Um, the only thing that would have required executive session would be if there were questions as to the exact placement. Again, I can tell you that we've received input from principals, what they can see, but also from public safety. The total cost is $28,599. Um, I would be in favor of a very quick executive session to review that information, and then we can come back uh, in uh, open session and vote for the, the that amount. Perfect. And um, I just want to check, would you like to, um, and then when we return, we can run through and make sure we did all the votes on the action items, which I think we just have more. That sounds great. Okay. Okay. Uh, you do need to take a roll call vote to go into executive session. And I believe that I gave you the vote that's required of why you're here. All right. Um. Sorry, I'm also making the breakout room at the same time. Um, motion, uh, do I hear a motion to ex enter into executive session for the purpose of um, discussing sensitive information about the placement of security um, devices and, um, and that we will resume an open session in order to um, vote on the outcome? So moved. Do I hear a second? Um, and roll call, uh, Tara. Aye. Christine. Here. Kumara. Aye. Um, to uh, for a vote on the um, Verkata uh, security cameras. Um, this is for the purchase of some additional cameras to round out the coverage um, that we already invested in. Um, close to a year ago now. Do I hear a motion to approve the spending of $20,599 uh, for those additional cameras? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you, everyone. All right, and thank you for staying the additional time to you go through. Just if you, do you, I'm sorry, do we mind just running through those action yeah. items? Let's do that. Yeah. So I think we've done everything. We don't have a revised cost estimate for locker painting. So you have school committee meetings and warrants. And then I've gone to. Um, so item L through P. Uh, that you did P. So item L, M, N, and O. That's correct. Okay, Just great. So do I hear a motion to approve the July 12th school committee minutes? So moved. Okay. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Do I hear a motion to approve the July 26th school committee minutes? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Do I hear a motion to approve the July 28th school committee minutes? 
So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Do we hear a motion to approve the warrants of July 2023? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, Annie. Does that do it for us? A motion to adjourn. And you are. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. Seconded. All in favor. Everyone. Aye.